Hi, Chad Brinson here with Palo Alto Networks, and I'm very pleased to welcome to Ignite 2014 Parmi Olson. It's good to have you. Thank you. Parmi, you're the first uh, inductee into our cybersecurity canon, and mm -hmm. the book that, uh, that got us there was We Are Anonymous. Right. Obviously, uh, a very important book from the past years, really talking about key events that um, shaped the security discourse and uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of what's coming. Mm -hmm. um, in the years since you researched and wrote the book, what are the big takeaways from Anonymous? What, what lingers? Well, first of all, Anonymous as an entity hasn't been as big as it was two or three years ago. So some of the activity that we were seeing before, companies being attacked, FBI agents arresting people in the UK and the US, that really hasn't happened hardly at all in the last one to two years. Um, it's probably a lot to do with all the big arrests that happened in 2012, which put off other people in the community trying to do the same thing and think that they could get away with it. The takeaways from there, I think, are really just how easy it was for a lot of those guys to hack some of the websites that they did and steal the data that they did. So many of these even corporate websites were so badly protected, weren't encrypting consumer data, and it really showed up a lot of the security flaws that some of these um, victims, these corporate victims, um, weren't actually patching. So I think since then, a lot of companies have hopefully, it seems, improved their cybersecurity basic hygiene. And I think the cybersecurity community generally has been kind of validated in what they've been trying to say for the last few years that it only takes a few, a little bit more investment to protect databases, particularly consumer databases that have customer data. Um, from even the most amateur attacks, which can be successful. You've been on the beat with uh, with Forbes for a good long time, and it, it sounds like it's fair to say that over the last five years, with revelations about Anonymous and everything up through the present with Target, um, the dialogue has heightened. Mm -hmm. Whether whether enterprises in particular are getting there yet um, is one thing, mm -hmm. but uh, we all we are talking about it more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, my own beat has moved more towards mobile, mm -hmm. which I think people who are in the mobile industry are kind of saying the same thing that security professionals were saying a few years ago, which is that security on mobile is important. It's going to become a bigger issue over time um, with the rise of the Internet of Things as well. More devices have more sophisticated sensors which are sucking in more data every day, transferring that to third parties. And there's always going to be some other uh, unscrupulous third party that wants to get in the middle of that. Um, so I think the discourse is changing in that it's not just desktop base, which is really where Anonymous was in 2010. We were talking about desktop websites that were getting attacked. Now the, the discussion has moved over towards mobile devices and what are the types of threats that those types of companies and, and services are seeing now. For sure, and we at Palo Alto Networks, we spend a lot of time both on the research side looking at mobile malware and on the technology side making sure we're right fitting our platform to not just sort of extending certain rules out to mobile devices. It sounds like you have to go a bit deeper than that. What's, what's top of mind when it comes to mobile malware? What are you tracking right now? Well, the general perception is that Android is the platform with the biggest malware problems, mm -hmm. although um, iPhones and iOS isn't completely safe. Um, but particularly, um, you know, it really boils down to where you live in the world. So people in China who have Android phones, you know, are much more likely than Americans to download their apps from third-party websites, and therefore much more likely to download apps with malware. Um, so I think perhaps in some way the malware problem on mobile isn't seen as a huge issue yet for people in the U.S. or Western Europe who have better access to Google Play, although, again, even Google Play has, has well been criticized for um, you know, dispensing apps with malware on them. Mm -hmm. But really, that issue boils down to where you live in the world. As, uh, as a journalist, digging into uh, a lot of what you had to dig into for We Are Anonymous and certainly exposing a lot of these things on the mobile beat uh, and beyond, um, how much of a challenge is it to, to invest in this community, to really understand uh, all the players? I mean, with all the heightened uh, discussion around mm -hmm. cybersecurity topics, uh, it's journalists coming up very close among, among many of the bad actors. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's a huge amorphous community, mm -hmm. and even though I got quite close to some of the main actors, I would still say that it was really just scratching the surface, and I don't think any one person can really cover um, everything so comprehensively, which is why it's so great that so many reporters were looking at the issue. Um, the way to kind of infiltrate, if you will, that network was really just to build trust with people, as you would with any network. Um, 
I was upfront with everybody I interviewed that I was a journalist, what I was trying to do. Sometimes I was writing for the web, sometimes I was writing for the magazine, and at one point I was writing a book. And when I was writing the book, um, people who were in Anonymous were a little bit more free to talk because they knew that what they were saying wasn't going to be public right away, that there would be some amount of time. Um, and I think a lot of people in Anonymous as well kind of liked this idea of leaving behind a legacy of social agitation, that this wasn't just disrupting websites because they could, but because they actually wanted to make a statement about those sites. Now, that wasn't always the case. It's a very messy kind of community, but it was really interesting to explore that. And that nugget, um, which we discussed in various ways as hacktivism or mm -hmm. any of the other euphemisms we use, is, is very real. It's that messy community, but hacktivism is something that's, that's front and center. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is why Anonymous had that power. It, anybody who used that name, the logo, the imagery, um, the catchphrases could ride on the reputation that other people had created, that other attacks had built a reputation for, um, if ever they wanted to, to call attention. Now, over the course of a couple of years after I wrote the book, um, you know, it's almost like crying wolf after a while. The media started to lose a little bit of interest in, in, in the group or in the community, and, and of course people were getting arrested. So I think, I feel like online communities are looking for that next wave of online activism. We had, um, you know, the Occupy Wall Street mm -hmm. phase. Um, the kind of latest big name in online activism is the Syrian Electronic Army, and who knows really who's backing them exactly. Um, but it's been a while since we've seen a kind of big wave in online activism, and I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if something crops, crops up in the next couple of years, but I have no idea what name that's going to come under or what form that will take. Primarily, we've covered uh, mobile malware and uh, the, the challenges in the mobile ecosystem and hacktivism. What other topics are, uh, are front of mind for you right now? Um, well, I'm very interested in the rise of wearable devices, um, particularly health and fitness wearables. It's still really early days for that industry, but what really fascinates me is not only the data that individuals can collect for themselves, but also how that can affect what they might pay their insurance provider and how that's going to, to change the nature of the relationship between an employer and staff, knowing that they can be tracked and that can affect how much they pay um, for health care. And I think it'll be really interesting to see what kind of radical models are put in place to try and, health care costs are such a huge problem right now, so what kind of radical tracking methods are some companies going to use to, um, to bring those costs down? Um, so I've been dabbling in that area a little bit and, and looking to see who's going to take that first really radical step. And you mentioned that, and earlier you mentioned the Internet of Things, and mm -hmm. I, it seems like the appetite for that kind of coverage uh, is starting to grow. I mean, mm -hmm. there, we have some extreme and occasionally facetious examples, such as hacking refrigerators mm -hmm. and, and, and livestock with IP addresses, but you are seeing a, a growing trend toward uh, wanting to know more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's as more and more devices are becoming connected to the Internet, obviously there's big security risks with that. Um, cars that are connected online, uh, that perhaps instead of having one processor or one computer, they have two computers, or instead of two computers, they have one computer, and then that actually makes it more of a uh, more of a risk for the for the user. Those kinds of cars aren't out yet, of course, but they may well be in the next couple of years. Um, so I think it's still really like uncharted territory, particularly for people in the cybersecurity community. Um, I think it's going to be a major headache too. Um, but it's really just a question of what kind of bad actors are going to come in and exploit that. And of course, we'll be there to cover it. For sure. Um, yeah. Will we see another book? Not at the moment. I'm not working on any um, nonfiction book at the moment. But, uh, you know, I have been in touch with the people who were arrested uh, from Anonymous. Um, and I've been very interested in finding out about their prison experiences, um, how they've reformed themselves, how they're finding life after prison. And that's not really, I don't think that's really book-worthy material necessarily, but certainly something that I've, I'm pursuing in my coverage with Forbes and our online coverage. Um, I'd like to look into that a little bit more. Well, we'll be reading. Glad to have you uh, here at Ignite and in the cybersecurity canon. Parmi Olson, mm -hmm. thank you so All much. Right, thank you.